Markus Wiebjör, GIZ. GIZ is the implementing agency of the government of Germany. And uh, yeah, we, we are working in many areas, not only in electricity, but also climate change, uh, the, uh, environmental issues, nature management, uh, etc. Uh, we work with the Bureau of Energy Efficiency on uh, their issues, but also on good integration of renewables. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have a particular interest in district cooling, or let's say central cooling, uh, of course, because uh, yeah, cooling is going through the roof, and uh, from the climate change perspective, uh, it is definitely an area uh, where everyone has to work on in order uh, to, to get things right, because the numbers which we had seen in the IEA presentation, for example, uh, if that materializes by 2050, uh, that planet is gone, right? So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, too. Uh, Marcus, maybe you can um, share your view on, you've been in India for a long time and working in the various energy projects, and, and, and uh, as I understand, you move into uh, district cooling uh, potential projects as well. Maybe you can share a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, my, my first impression from, from today's discussion, uh, I would just like to start with that. Uh, is, uh, I heard it a couple of times also, uh, can we get GST exemption or uh, can there be, let's say, or a subsidy or something with the gas prices? Of course, I under fully understand, but the, the fundamental issue is each sector is asking for that. So if the government really would uh, give in, then the government would not collect any GST and actually only subsidies. So, uh, I mean, I fully understand from where we are coming, but I think that's, that's something which it sh is not a good starting point. And on the other hand, uh, what I understand is, and that's why I really like the idea of, of district cooling, uh, you can easily scale it up. So perhaps at the beginning, when you only have few buildings, you still have quite high costs, but the more buildings you can actually connect, then at marginal cost, then total cost comes down per unit. And, and therefore, there is the question, uh, how much money is required actually to kickstart this up front? And then uh, perhaps after some time, when it gains scale, it will be economically viable. And so there is now the question, how we get there? Is that a role which the government needs to take on? Or, or is that something which the private sector will resolve itself? Probably, I mean, uh, a mix of both. But the, the, the interesting part is again here, uh, what are we looking at? Uh, if we just look from the viewpoint of a solution for cooling, again, it becomes very difficult. But if we look actually from the viewpoint of the municipality, that there need to be an integrated approach where you not only address cooling but also uh, water, wastewater, and uh, pipe gas, whatever, then again, complete different story. Uh, and uh, uh, the question is how to get there. And, and now I go back to what Peter asked me. Really, uh, since 15 years I'm here, uh, things have changed already a lot in those 15 years, but the, the major issue here is, and that's probably completely different from China, uh, nothing or almost nothing works from the center. India is uh, actually concurrent in, in particular when it comes to electricity, but also with other services, meaning that the center has actually no say on what the individual states are going to decide. So this is the first problem we have. Second problem is that, uh, and this has also not improved, uh, there is no trust in, uh, let's say, centralized systems. Uh, people believe, don't believe that uh, it will last long and they are always afraid and unfortunately I think history has taught them also that in most of the cases they were right. After some time no one will take responsibility, no one will take care and they will end up to look after things themselves. That's why everywhere you find split, individual split units, and no one is going for central cooling in uh, residential building blocks. Uh, because no one wants to, to have a system and pay for that system, but no one actually might be in charge. Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, fundamental, I think. And, and 
yeah, how how to get there, this this is very, very difficult. On the other hand, I have seen very successful campaigns. For example, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, when uh, the star labeling was introduced, uh, also I think now about 10 years back, uh, the Bureau started with these very nice TV and radio campaigns. Very funny short clip spots and uh, everyone uh, was somehow seeing, watching, listening, and, and everyone talked about it. And I think that helped a lot to uh, at least change a bit the behavior towards electrical appliances uh, and, and, and the electricity use. Uh, then, of course, ESL. This is a phenomenon which is uh, quite typical, uh, or let's say quite unique for, for India, but it has changed also things a lot. Uh, light bulb, the LEDs, uh, which which were uh, first sold at a price of maybe uh, five six dollars a piece have come down to fifty euro cents uh, fifty US cents uh, in in a span of uh, five years and and this is due to let's say very smart uh, policy application and uh, yeah then another phenomenon in India is uh, that uh, sometimes. Uh, India is quite frugal also compared to other countries in the world. So people here are still um, thinking about their electricity consumption and, and, and would rather use a fan than the air conditioner if the temperature still allow it. And, and people are probably also due to the history still, still in that. Um, that's why we actually do not yet see these uh, tremendous predictions of uh, air conditioner growth coming through because I'm hearing this since I'm in India that the uh, split air conditioner sales would go through the roof etc but actually uh, those years 2006-7 we were at maybe three and a half million and now okay it has doubled but in other parts of the world it has quadrupled so this also shows something of course it's also something which has to do with uh, the our affordability, etc. But still, I, I would say there are some specific factors in India which make the thing different. Okay, putting all this together means, uh, in, in, I think there is no approach where we can copy from any other country. We have to find a way uh, to deal with this India specific. But my idea how we perhaps could do that, and, and I, I'm testing this also in the discussions with all of you uh, times and again, is uh, yeah, we, we can use perhaps the, or make use of the distribution companies here, the utilities. We all know they are in bad shape, but if we bring in other additional services which can also come from district cooling or centralized cooling, for example, load shifting, I thought actually we would have that in the second panel, but that topic didn't really come out that, that much, but I see a lot of potential in, in this particular uh, topic. So if, for example, distribution companies could take over and, and become also the service provider and, and take that business model further forward and, and then use it also for ancillary services in order to stabilize the grid. And, and if we also see the, the potential, uh, the, the distribution companies usually uh, do not need all that peak energy for a long time. Uh, in Delhi right now needs about 7.5 gigawatt peak in, in, in the summer, but uh, in, on average it is actually rather 5.5. So uh, more than two gigawatts are act for that peak are actually used only maybe one hour a day in, in those periods. So if we could bridge that gap with uh, demand response or load shifting, uh, this would be already a huge saving in cost. If that could be used in order to promote something like district cooling, uh, then uh, we perhaps have, have a business model. Of course, that's something it still would need financing because the distribution companies do not have that money to invest. And also, I'm afraid at present, they are also not that credit worthy to <laughs> Ask even the development banks for, for that money, so something needs to be resolved in here. However, the government also in, in the last 15 years, I think, has, has also become more focused on, on these problems, at least at the center. That's what I feel, and then 
I mean, uh, the things which are happening in the renewable energy sector right now, I think, are encouraging uh, that the center actually, with their push and pull, uh, gets somehow close to the targets they have set for themselves. And uh, if that similar drive could be also applied to the cooling sector, uh, the India Cooling Action Plan is a first step in that. Again, I'm actually not too pessimistic that things can be achieved. It takes time, yeah, and many things are... I have started 15 years back, I still not get done, we're not over, but uh, definitely things are improving, and uh, that makes me kind of optimistic. Thank you, Marcus. That was uh, for a very uh, interesting <coughs> comment. Uh, so, I, I actually, I, I was... Um, just been aware that we supposed to have uh, another panelist joining us. So I think we want to inv invite Mr. Rajiv Sharma. Please come to this grab a chair and you have a seat. Uh, he is from the Gujarat, Gu Gujarat International Finance Tech City. Please again. Yeah. Thank you. We we're, we're shifting places, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, okay. Uh, so okay, Rajiv, can you can you share a little bit your um, what, what your your impressions, what you heard today about this cooling and some uh, challenges and uh, maybe opportunities, and uh, especially from Gujarat a uh, Gujarat perspective. You know, um, thank you for inviting me here. And it's fortunate to, since morning till now, hear each of you. And almost everybody is making sense as to, uh, from my point of view, uh, because I am one of the operator of 10,000 ton district cooling system, day in, day out, hands on. So I, I see we are talking about all practical issues here, uh, up to 90% are all realistic issues. So uh, what, what I think uh, the main issue that, that was since morning till now was more like grid and power and, and how to open up the sector and all. So whatever has been said is all relevant. So I would rather not repeat it. And, and as just now gentleman said, in 15 years, there will be perhaps similarly more time when we see things change. And then in the morning, somebody said we have to push the government. So on, our, on that side, that's what we are doing. We are pushing the government. So we have got a waiver on the power on the electricity supply, 15% that comes to the district cooling system. 15% in the waiver means about 50 to 60 lakh rupees per annum. My electricity bill is about 5.5 crores per annum. So it's like a huge percentage of that. And we are, and we are still talking to government on, on other things, including bringing in bringing in district cooling as a as a utility just like power or water. Unfortunately that is not there. And because it is not there, government cannot just bring more more to the table. Until unless it is stemmed as a as a regular uh, you know service. So so that's where we see um, a lock which needs to be opened. And we are not working on too many fronts. Uh, putting your power here everywhere and uh, putting energy doesn't really is helping. So that's what we are doing. Um, trying to open one, one, going one step at a time. So that's what we have achieved. We are working on more, trying to, um, trying to put this thing into an organized sector and then talk about uh, regulating, bringing more regulatory reforms on that side. District cooling definitely is the is the word, no doubt. Uh, 
and as Tabri, uh, gentleman from Tabri, you know, he, he is in the business, he knows, and we have learned with about uh, 30 to 40 percent diversity, you cannot beat it. So, so our loads are about 245,000 tons for 62 million square foot. We are going to install only 145,000 tons. So that's the saving. That's all. Don't don't worry about everything, anything else. And that's a realistic figure. And that's a realistic figure. We are working with that. I'm currently connected with about more than 10,000 tons operating my 5,000 tons or less than 5,000 tons. And I'm next year going to get connected to 20,000 tons. And we'll still be operating at about 5,000, 4,000 tons. So that's the diversity in hand. And that's what brings down my power grid required. I don't need a big power power. Grid. So that's the saving, that's that's all is hidden there. And um, and and this and this is one part, you know, policy and then and then diversity, all this that makes it viable. That's the that's the way to go. And, I, and, and every time people like Tabreed who are into the business and more knowledgeable people, they must be questioning here and there, wherever there is a 5,000 ton load, what are we doing? Why are we putting split units? In Delhi. I belong to Delhi. So, when you see these whole 10 story buildings with so many split units, oh, it's a crazy thing. So what are we doing? We are increasing the heat island, at the same time we are messing it up. The second part on the optimization, if, if, if I am not going to out of the way, second part on the optimization, everybody is talking coach engine. What we are doing is, as everybody has said, when the district coding load increases, the power load increases. We are introducing solar into our system, into our grid. And that's going to beat down that peak on the power. And that's the another thing where we would win. Those are the areas where we are attacking and, and they are sure shot that we will build them. And from there we will make another step, more informed step forward. So one by one slowly we are going forward. And we have to count the cash at the end of the day and show it to the principal that that's the saving because that's the operating problem. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, you also mentioned you have a presentation. Uh, maybe we can finish like with, to, with that. Like to see the presentation. There's something that I said is if we can, maybe we can end, end with that. Uh, end the session. Uh, you can put it there in front of the yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I would like to continue with uh, to breed <coughs> and uh, uh, so. What I mean, you're, you, Chapir has been developing many district cooling projects. Uh, so, what advice would you give to, in general, uh, when you develop district cooling projects? So, some of the learnings that has been captured from the Middle East when we approached India is to always. So, one of the problems in Middle East has been building over capacity. So, in India being the frugal market it is, it is one of the most sophisticated we found with all our learnings of the Middle East and Europe. We found even for standalone systems, people here design the most sophisticated systems possible. Uh, so, for a utility player coming in and aggregating loads at a central location, so we have to be very uh, sure of what loads are we putting. Uh, networks, again, yeah. there are some bit, bit of pre-investment in the networks and uh, timelines are uncertain unlike in uh, uh, European markets and unlike in the other parts of the world where district cooling has been adopted and has been pushed through regulation so the developer is more or less sure of where the timeline you know how the timeline is going to look like of connections of how and that all that plays out on all how you uh, what end benefit you can pass on to the user and this makes the economic case out of it. So in India the timelines are uncertain. So as modular as possible, we are trying to approach the market which a very modular approach and 
so just like and take as many innovations as possible so one of the cases which i'm sure uh, we will see in the presentation of gift city is thermal energy storage tanks so if you are not sure of modular capacity this is one learning we bring from dubai in dubai the government mandates if you have a cooling central cooling plant more than 10000 ton 25% of it should be tes period no other way out you have to build a tes other than the many benefits uh, peak peak demand shaving of efficiency benefits of of peak tariffs utilization and all this gives a lot of flexibility and drives an economic case where uh like in financing models for such projects large scale aggregated projects a single developer is taking the entire financial risk this can be either a make or break kind of a, a situation where tes gives you flexibility without investing upfront into your plant into your hard assets right and when you approach uh, developers in uh, or uh, try to develop this economic project in india so is is how much do you do you also promote uh, thermal energy storage or is yeah. that included to the one of our core learnings has been india space is precious so we seem to be very vast country we seem to develop so much we carpet bomb everywhere but wherever we build space is precious a developer will want to extract the last amount of fsi or you know developable potential available and will not want to uh, make available a separate plot for a district utility uh, or a central utility plot in cases where we are approaching so we are approaching projects where large basements interconnected basements where there are 3 or 4 or 5 million square feet of space being developed we are aggregating everything in large basements like combining two or three basements where we still don't have uh possibility to integrate thermal energy storage tanks the water part but we can still look at brine solutions or ice storage solutions again innovative solutions which bring down which serve the same purpose take a hit on the cop not as high cop as a water system can deliver but yeah so we do push for such things and we try to we are trying to illustrate uh benefits of a storage solution to developers but space is again a drawback of this storage solution because they need a uh clear height space at least 10 to 12 meters with which you know a storage area large enough say 300 or 400 square meters separately where in a 1000 square meter area your entire chiller plant can fit in but a single uh, 3000 rt 12000 trh tank will take Uh, 400 square meters on its own which is say 25% of the entire plan so yeah that's one again one practical issue we are dealing with right thank you um anant you you come from another perspective uh, the iic you work with the energy efficiency and uh, policies and uh, regulations so from from your perspective um how do you see the development of this cooling and what what is the best way of of uh, developing this cooling projects in india uh, so from this cooling uh, uh, we have been hearing from uh, everyone uh, if if we look at the readiness framework of the technology we see that technology is available uh, technology is ready uh, it is well demonstrated so we can take the technology part uh, but if we look at the policy readiness and the market readiness uh, we we have some question marks there uh in terms of policy readiness uh, i would agree uh, with you sir that uh, we need to uh, go for an approach where we can uh, define cooling as a service uh in that case only we can have aggregated demand of a uh, city or district level or a community level uh because uh, right now if we look at the landscape uh, we have a lot of centralized plants in big campuses uh in in uh, large developments uh, but these are confined to a single uh, owner a uh, one single campus uh, has the centralized plant and they are uh, using it as a uh, cooling uh, source uh, but to term it as a district cooling uh, where different different consumers are connected to the uh, central uh, central utility uh, we have to uh, make it a service and then uh, the policy uh, can come in uh, where they can define uh, the uh, levelized cost uh, and they can define the rules and regulations 
for laying out the networks, uh, uh, how how to use the land, uh, and who will provide the uh, land to the utility, utility, and uh, what kind of companies can become the utility, uh, uh, what sort of businesses that would be, and how profit can be shared. So those policy aspects are still missing uh, in, into the system. Uh, and then uh, we, we need to also uh, look simultaneously at, at the market readiness because uh, a lot of people are still not aware how to design uh, uh, the, these kind of systems. Uh, what, uh, what sort of automation is required because uh, we will need a metering at a lot of points. Uh, if, if, uh, if we can compare it with the uh, city gas network or, or a city uh, water network, uh, you can get some sort of idea that uh, we need a leakage detection uh, points, we need uh, some uh, access points for uh, repair and maintenance, we will be needing uh, a lot of infrastructure around uh, the monitoring uh, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, generating revenues from that. So that, that awareness into market is also required that how to design that kind of systems. Uh, so these two aspects, uh, I see that we still need to work out our policy and the market readiness side. Thank you for that. Great. Uh, I have a question for that maybe both Marcus and Tu can, can comment on. So, um, how can existing finance mechanism uh, be leveraged or changed to, to promote this to cooling? Um, working? Um, well, I think before we, we really tap into finance, we, we need to know uh, from the perspective of the financier, uh, what do you want from the, the financer? Uh, and, and how can the financer be sure that what you propose is going to last for 30, 40 years and uh, that he sees his money back? Uh, and presently, as, as we have now confirmed several times in the discussion, the policy framework in India is not yet there. So in the absence of, of a stable policy framework and also in the absence of, let's say, proven business models, I would say it's rather difficult to convince any financing institution, regardless whether it's private or, or public, uh, to actually invest in that. Great. Uh, I have a question for that maybe both Marcus and Tu can, can comment on. So, um, how can existing finance mechanism uh, be leveraged or changed to, to promote this to cooling? Okay. Um, working? Um, well, I think before we, we really tap into finance, we, we need to know uh, from the perspective of the financier, uh, what do you want from the, the financer? Uh, and, and how can the financer be sure that what you propose is going to last for 30, 40 years and uh, that he sees his money back? Uh, and presently, as, as we have now confirmed several times in the discussion, the policy framework in India is not yet there. So in the absence of, of a stable policy framework and also in the absence of, let's say, proven business models, I would say it's rather difficult to convince any financing institution, regardless whether it's private or, or public, uh, to actually invest in that. And uh, therefore, uh, Presently, I, I would say the, 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 there's a lot of homework to be done. We as, let's say, an uh, agency for technical cooperation could do that and we very much want to do that together with the Indian government institutions. But again, here what, what we need is uh, we need to see successful pilots. Uh, of course, there have been already a lot of pilots here and there, but still I think they are not yet enough and not yet convincing. So if, if, for example, a big governmental institution like CPWD or NBCC could be convinced to, to go for a district cooling project and they would successfully implement that, surely I think the BEE would be able to come up with, with a policy. And, uh, but we, we don't have these successful 
pilots yet. Right? And uh, the, there, so there's still work to be done on that front. Uh, the other thing is, uh, we, as, as I mentioned earlier, we are in a concurrent system. And actually we are talking to municipalities. And, and what really is lacking here is that integrated urban planning. Uh, and and uh, even if we have it for a case like Amaravati, then the moment the political winds change, again, it becomes difficult. Uh, so just put yourself now into the shoes of a financing institution observing all this. Uh, it becomes very difficult to commit a substantial amounts of funding for 30, 40 years. Maybe I hand over to ADB. <laughs> <laughs>